Welcome to The Crossing Church. This is the version of The Crossing that goes where you go and delivers what you need. Fresh perspectives on faith and Jesus with practical, real-life next steps built in. This is your place to explore faith and experience the life-changing ways of Jesus. Hi, I'm Nicole. I get to be one of the teaching pastors here at The Crossing, the place to explore faith and experience the life-changing ways of Jesus. Now, my husband and I have been married for 24 years. We've basically spent our lives learning to love each other. When you've been best friends with someone that long, there's a lot of history, right? So sometimes I get flashes of memories and I suddenly recall mistakes that I made like early on and I get this like wave of embarrassment. Does that happen to you? Like flashes of memories of moments where you messed up? Hmm, here's one of mine. Early on in our relationship, there was a night that my wonderful husband wanted to go dancing. Now, I want very much to dance with my husband, but when he asked me if I would go dancing with him, I replied, I don't want to dance with you. It's cool, huh? It's newlywed me said something so hurtful and dumb. I still remember it. Why would I say that? Not because I don't like dancing, not because I don't like him. I love dancing. I love him. But because most of my life, I have been stubbornly, aggressively against trying new things in front of people, having to learn, looking dumb, being bad at something, while other people witnessed my incompetence. To fail while you witness it? No. I would rather say no to something I actually really, really want. And so I said, I don't want to dance with you. When what I meant was, I don't want to fail in front of you. I don't want you to see me as less than because I don't know how to dance that well. I want you to see me as good and graceful and talented. So would you please just imagine me that way? Have you ever been afraid to try something new or learn something? Change a habit, practice a new language, pray in front of people, share your faith, dance with someone. Maybe take on a new project at work or talk to someone at school you wanna be friends with. Back in high school, we would go to the beach every Sunday with our friends and I would watch other people play volleyball, but never play myself because I had tried volleyball a few times in PE and been bad at it. And so I decided I don't play volleyball. I don't like volleyball. What have you said no to or opted out of, denied yourself because you were closed off to the learning process, because you didn't want to fail, because you wanted to look good in front of other people? Do you know who holds the record for the most missed shots in NBA history? Kobe Bryant. I just learned this. One of the greatest players in all of NBA history holds the record for the most missed shots. There is this interview with Kobe where he said, I play to figure things out. I play to learn something. Failure doesn't exist. It's a figment of your imagination because the story continues. If you fail on Monday, the only way it's a failure is if you decide to stop. Fail on Monday and try again on Tuesday and try again on Wednesday. You're learning. Stopping is the worst thing you can do. A life where we play each day to learn things, where failure doesn't exist, where no matter what we do wrong, we get to shake it off and get back up and try again. Man, is that really possible for us? Sometimes I will now watch compilation videos of Kobe missing shots, just to remind myself what that kind of champion looks like. The person who is open to learning, in front of the world, taking the shots and missing and trying again. That's the one who can actually be great. Welcome to part four in our family style series. Every family has a style. The Crossing family has a style. Your family has one too. And now whether that style is accidental or purposeful is up to us. A purposeful family style has a vision to live for and values to live by. And if you want your style, your family style, to be one where you are able to let go of perfectionism, to stop torturing yourself for past failures, you're able to try new things, learn and try again and become great, even with people watching, today is for you. 
How do we overcome our fears, our like ingrained old behaviors, our inherited ways of being, and be willing to try again? Man, how do you keep trying as a mom or a dad when you feel like you keep messing it up? How do you keep showing up to work with enthusiasm when you know you blew it yesterday, maybe even the day before? How do you try again to get healthy when you have failed at it too many times to count? The core mindset shift is in what Kobe said. The story continues. The story continues. God is on the move. God's story continues past anything we see as a failure. I love in Isaiah 43, 19 how it says it. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. If we can learn what that means for us, we can become people who try new things, learn, and try again. Who can play to learn and who know failure doesn't really exist. Who can say yes to the things we want most to try without that same crushing fear. We can have eyes to see what God is inviting us into without already deciding, like, no, that's not for me. I can't do it. Why do we sabotage ourselves anyway? It's because we forget that the story continues. We stop in a place because of fear or past failures or exhaustion or weirdly sometimes when we reach a level of success or comfort we try to stop right there so we can hold it somehow we just say this is good enough about our faith good enough about our lives but life moves forward and we're meant to always move forward with it the bible is the key to understanding that the story continues that's what it's all about. That's literally what the book is about. God's story continuing and growing and expanding. So let's talk about that from the book of Matthew in chapter 9. Now, we as a church, we have an app. It's The Crossing CM. You can download it and take notes there. Otherwise, let's go from here. Now, there's this moment in Jesus' ministry when he's inviting his disciples to follow him. Guys of all kinds of backgrounds, and none of them are really especially accomplished because if they'd shown any real aptitude for memorizing the old scriptures or debating the laws, they would have already been studying under a religious leader. But here comes this rabbi, Jesus, specifically inviting these guys to follow him and learn the ways of God from him. Why? Well, Jesus is not like other rabbis or leaders. It's very clear to people that he is different, he's doing things differently, but they don't know why he is the way he is. So especially the other rabbis and their disciples try to figure him out, and they want to know why. Like, why aren't your disciples following the same strict rules as us? Why don't you join in and compete in the, like, who's the best rabbi and leader game that we've designed? Why aren't you trying to be the best at this like we are? Jesus responds to them with a parable. He says, No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment for the patch will pull away from the garment, making the tear worse. Neither do people pour new wine into old wineskins. If they do, the skins will burst, the wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins, and both are preserved. What does he mean? Well, Jesus is describing what he's doing as making new wine. New wine, it still needs to ferment. It's this like living, changing experiment, fermenting grapes into wine. There's lots of chemical reactions happening. New things are being made, and it's active and powerful. Jesus is doing something like that. Okay, but we don't make wine at home, so most of us have probably never seen it or understand why the old wineskin would burst. But a modern example is people trying to make kombucha at home. So it's fermented, it's this fermented drink, and the fermenting is actually really dangerous because the gases are expanding when it's fermenting. And so people put their new kombucha in glass bottles and then seal it, and if they don't let out the expanding gases at certain times, there is an explosion when they try to open it. New wine is fermenting and expanding. So the new wineskins were made of leather from goats or sheep, so a new wineskin is stretchy, and it can expand with the wine as it ages and changes. An old wineskin has already stretched to its limits. It's hard and almost stone-like, so if you put in new wine and it starts to ferment and expand, 
the old wineskin, it can't stretch with it and it bursts and you lose everything. So if you have new wine, you must put it in new wineskin so it can expand as the wine expands. The disciples Jesus chose were not people already part of the religious structure where they had to do everything right and try to work their way up the ranks, where they had already kind of hardened their minds around the way the system works. They were still stretchy and flexible and open to Jesus' weird ways. The new expanding work of Jesus was bringing something new into the whole world. If the disciples had been students who wanted to be impressive, to look good in everyone else's eyes, to like move up in the ranks in the temple power structure, Jesus was not the rabbi to follow. Jesus is not the mentor who's gonna introduce you to the other department heads so you can move up and get invited to go golfing or something, make more money, get a fancy office. He's not interested in any of the power plays or rules of the game. He's not teaching them how to be impressive or perfect in the world's eyes. He's not trying to be the best at the old systems of success. He is doing a totally different thing. If you are feeling stuck, God can give you a fresh start. It's not too late. If you know you've grown hard and stubborn and just stuck in ways you don't want to be stuck, God can bring a newness to your heart. He says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. It is never too late to try again. All of us have times where we get stuck. Man, by chapter 18 in Matthew, Jesus' disciples have started to get stuck. They, they think they've grown up a bit, maybe a bit too much. They've seen some success. They've liked being admired. And they start asking Jesus questions like the other leaders would. Like, how do we rise to the top? How do we look good? How can we be great men? The disciples, they came to Jesus and asked, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child to him and placed the child among them and he said, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. I love that picture of all the disciples around asking Jesus this, and he brings this kid and puts him like right there in the middle of all these guys who are trying to be so grown up, who are asking, how do we be leaders? How do we be champions? And Jesus grabs this like little kid, like sticky, dirty, cute little kid, and is like, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven unless you change and become like this little kid. If you're not around kids very often, you might honestly wonder, why? Like, what is it about kids that Jesus is referring to? From a serious adult's perspective, kids are loud and sticky and demanding and really not very good at adult things, right? But when you get to know small kids, when you can spend like unhurried time with them, a toddler will show you how beautiful the world is. They'll have you watching like, one flower in the breeze for 10 minutes straight. Or you'll sit and watch a beetle walk along the ground. Bottle caps become like beautiful little pools for roly polies. Rocks are precious and they can be played with like cars. A kindergartner will ask you questions you would never think to ask because their mindset is still so open. The possibilities are endless. My kids would borrow my makeup and paint their faces like lions and roam the house like it was the African savanna. And how do kids learn? Take walking, for example. How do they learn to walk? Well, they see you do it, right? So they try, they fall, and then you're cheering them on, you're letting them know they can do it again, try again. Same with our lives now. We watch Jesus and then we try, we fall, but then we let ourselves be encouraged. We can do it, we try again, right? I mean, are you gonna tell a one-year-old they're a failure for falling? No, are you gonna lecture them about how horrible they are for falling while trying to learn to walk? No, it's absurd, right? So why do we lay in bed at night and berate ourselves for falling down during the day somehow? We tried, okay, what did we learn? Try again, be like a child, it's play. Playing is how kids learn. In our daily lives, as we grow older, 
We get immersed in like daily routines of work, childcare, responsibilities. We lose our ability to play, to risk, to enjoy. There's this description of play that helps my adult brain see how I'm not doing it. It's from the um, Adaptation of Life by psychiatrist George Valent, and it just, it hit me in the gut. I found this very convicting for me, and I hope that it helps you. Here's what it says. It is hard to separate capacity to trust from capacity to play. For play is dangerous until we can trust both ourselves and others. In play, we must trust enough and love enough to risk losing without despair, to bear winning without guilt, and to laugh at error without mockery. Can we do those things? Trust is hard to separate from capacity to play. Without trust and love, play is dangerous. It is not fun. That feels right. So then how can we have more fun, more play in our lives to reclaim that childlike wonder and openness and flexibility? All right, so we're gonna use fun as an acronym to help us remember, to have fun. Fun is you have the Father's love. You can have an unassuming way about you and you can have a new heart every day. Have fun. Now, you have the Father's love. Trust that God loves you and you are his kid. Your worth never changes based on your performance. You are safe to learn and fall and mess up and try again. You're working on having a secure attachment to your heavenly Father. So psychology often talks about how the kind of attachment style you develop as a kid is really affects who you become as an adult. The healthiest attachment is called a secure attachment. It's where a child feels comforted by the presence of their caregiver, they feel protected and that they have someone to rely on, and they prefer their caregiver over strangers. They seek comfort in their caregiver and are comfortable exploring their environment with their present caregiver nearby. For many of us, developing a secure attachment to God is our first step to feel comforted by the presence of God, to feel protected and that you have someone to rely on in God. You'll prefer God to strangers. You'll seek comfort from God and are comfortable exploring your environment in God's presence. Try new things, learn, try again, because you trust God and God is present. Man, we think we're so grown up. We're like the disciples in Matthew 18. We're thinking like, we're just starting to figure this out. We're ready to level up, but we're just, toddlers in our eternal lives. We just got here. We are little kids living in our eternal father's house. We're going on adventures. We're playing. We're learning with him, and he is present with us, and it would serve a lot of us to remember that. Now, the verses that are my go-to verses to help me play and to keep my mind right on this and to be able, honestly, to learn things in front of people, to fall down and get back up, even with someone watching, it's in Romans 8 in the message version. God's spirit beckons. There are things to do and places to go. This resurrection life you received from God is not a timid, grave-tending life. It's adventurously expectant, greeting God with a child like, what's next, Papa? Greeting God with a child like, what's next, Papa? Man, this is a resurrection life, meaning Things are coming back to life. There is no failure here. There is no end after you fail and then that's just it. You are growing and expanding and trying again. It's why here at The Crossing, our mission statement starts with being the place to explore faith. That word explore is about being open and curious and playful and adventurous. To have a childlike view when it comes to faith and life. And that's how we then will experience the life-changing ways of Jesus. Sometimes we think we will experience Jesus when we get it all right and we figure it all out and we know the rules and how to follow them. But it's precisely in our ability to admit how little we know and be open to exploring with Jesus that we experience all the life change that he has for us, all the goodness. This new way of life, it's an adventurous, young at heart kind of life. The story continues, don't stop. 
This is not a timid, grave-tending life. It's adventurously expectant and full of new discoveries and new understandings and constant softening of us. We greet God with a childlike, what's next, Papa? And we continue the story. We want to have fun. You have the Father's love, and you also need an unassuming way. Embrace real humility. It's a way of moving through the world where you don't need to prop yourself up or tear anyone else down, and you're not afraid to fall because you are solidly held by God. My fear of dancing or playing volleyball, that was a humility issue. I didn't understand that I was still just a child of God, learning and expanding my understanding. I didn't have to be magically good at something in order to be good enough. I already was good because of God's love. Real humility gives you the confidence and freedom to play because you're not trying to look good. You can actually then take risks, trust, learn, grow. In the Bible, we notice a pattern that when we humble ourselves, we are then lifted that language is used all the time. For example, James 4.10 says, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. All right, so we have fun. You have the Father's love, you have an unassuming way, and you have a newness every day. Let's look back at that Romans 8 one more time. God's spirit beckons. There are things to do and places to go. This resurrection life you received from God is not a timid, grave-tending life. It's adventurously expectant, greeting God with a childlike, what's next, Papa? Greet God every day with that childlike, what's next, Papa? And let the story continue. Keep growing and exploring. If you think you have figured out God, if you start to ask those kinds of questions, like how can I be the greatest Christian? If you are afraid to try new things and you feel your life shrinking, that is a sign that you have lost your newness, that you are getting hard and stuck. I love how theologian John Corson said it. There is only one place a believer cannot stay. He cannot stay put. That is, he is either growing and expanding in his walk or he is shrinking and weakening in his walk. Your faith is either more radical today than it was last year or it is less. If we are determined together to soak in the word, we will experience a continuing renewing, new discoveries, new understanding, constant softening, and the Lord will be able to pour new wine into our vessels. The only place a believer cannot stay, you cannot stay put. Together at The Crossing, we will continue to explore faith, to soak in the word, and experience the continuing renewing of Jesus in our lives. Have you ever been afraid to try something new or learn something, to change a habit, to practice a new language, to pray in front of people, to share your faith, to dance with someone, take on a new project at work, or talk to someone at school you want to be friends with? What have you said no to, opted out of, denied yourself because you were closed off to the learning process, because you didn't want to fail, because you wanted to look good in front of other people? We are telling ourselves stories all day long. It's time to learn a new story, one where we can play, where we have fun, where we explore faith and experience the life-changing ways of Jesus every day. Let's pray. God, thank you so much that we can come to you with childlike wonder and faith and attitude. Help us to trust you as our Father the one who loves us and we are securely and safely attached to. So we can play, we can try new things, fall down, learn, try again, not be afraid to take the shot and miss because we know that the more shots we take, the better we're gonna get, the more we're gonna grow. Lord, help us to never stay put, to keep growing, to never think we've figured you out, to stay unassuming, humble, honest with ourselves and with you. Lord, take us on an adventure. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You give life, you are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope, you restore every heart. 
that is broken and great are you Lord you give life you are love you bring light to the darkness you give hope you restore Every heart that is broken And great are you, Lord And great are you, Lord Cease you pray Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing in grace. Green. 